everybody, Baker here from Board Online, Board Offline. Today I'm bringing you a review of Winds of Fortune from Safe Haven Games. This was Kickstarter a little while back, designed by Brian Mosley. And uh, in this game, you take the part of one of two different factions that are existing in a uh, post apocalyptic world, except in this case, the apocalypse occurred during the Age of Sail. So it's a naval combat game that has monsters and all kinds of crazy ships. And uh, a pretty cool idea, I think. I think there's there's a lot of uh, promise in that idea. I certainly thought so when I initially saw the game. I got to try to prototype. We're going to go down to the board, and I'm going to show you more about the game down there. That You're not going to see a whole lot of rules explanation here. For that, I have a, a separate video, but we are going to take a look, and you'll get enough of a feel for how the game works so you can see what's going on. So let's take a look. All right, so right off the rip, let me show you a couple of uh, things with the components here. Now, now you, the first thing I can show you pretty clearly is that these two player boards take up a lot of space on the table. Uh, in fact, you're probably, because of how much space they take up, you're going to be seeing a, a decent amount of my uh, floor and the mess in here uh, while I'm showing you this just because of, you know, it, it's it's practically falling off the table here in a couple of spots. Uh, now, the game boards do need to be a decent size because when you're playing with these cards you're going to tap them like that or exhaust them whatever you want to call it uh any, anytime you use them that way you know that you you've used them for that turn so you know you got to have that space to be able to do that uh, but at the same time it takes up a little bit more space than is absolutely necessary i think that being said i do like and by the way this is one player board here and then you have your uh opponent's player board there and really with uh, with this right here, this is another thing that I don't quite understand. You have these lo this location column here, and here's your location column here. And I don't understand why these boards weren't made to be mirror images of each other because having it offset like that, in my mind, is a little bit obnoxious. It, it, it just looks weird. There's no mechanical reason for it. Because locations can be targeted from any of these three lanes. Normally when you're playing, you, you fire down your lane. But when if you're firing at a location, any of the three lanes can fire at it. So there, mechanically, there's no reason for the locations to be over there. And I just think it would look better if the game boards were mirror images of each other. But that's not the way it is. It's, it's this way, I suppose. I don't, I don't know I don't know why it's on that. I'm guessing that it was cheaper to, to uh, produce just the same uh, the same game or the same game board over and over again maybe that's why it was like that all right so going back to the components the cards themselves are uh, there's nothing nothing real special about these cards as far as you know physically they are uh, a, a little bit on the thin side they have the the black border which I I'm not ever a big fan of because you pretty much the wear and tear is going to show up real fast on that and um, and, and they, they do have a tendency, you can see that they tend to kind of, if you touch them a little bit, they will do that little kind of rotate thing. So that, that's a little annoying. Now, um, the tokens are all fine. There's nothing wrong with the tokens. I, I like, these are your doubloons right here. You've got uh, in, Inspire and Demoralize tokens right there. And then you've got your... Uh, your damage one and three damage right there. All of them are fine. They are, are decent quality. They're even good quality, I'd say. You know, I, I think that, that that thickness there, they're gonna hold up pretty well. Um, certainly, I think they'll hold up better than the cards will over time. Um, and, and then, uh, the, oh, and the quality of the cardboard for the player boards is nice too. I do think that th this is good quality cardboard and it's gonna last. You know, these, these boards are tri-fold, I guess you could call it. So you're going to start getting some creasing, but that's pretty standard on all board games. Uh, as far what they want to say about the originality of this game, there are a lot of cool ideas for ships here. You know, you've got things from your pretty standard ship like this, the Legion, down to, uh, let's find the, the Floating Fortress right here which is just this massive, I mean, it looks like a fortress that's floating. I mean, I don't know how else to put it, but I mean, just the idea of having all those cannons on it and everything, that's pretty cool. 
And then you know, you've got your monsters like this, the uh, horror from beyond and a dire whale right here. So that's cool. And when the game show, shows up, you've got two kind of pre-built decks included. Uh, the one for, for this side is the... Um, Oh, the Holy Craftsmen, that's what they're called. And, you know, so they have, you know, the Harpy, and they do have a dragon on their side, so that's always a plus. And they've got things like the Inquisitor. And But you can see they're very ship-heavy. They're, they're very focused on ships. And then over here, you, on the, uh, the other side over here, we've got uh, the Cult of the Reef, which they're more monster-heavy. You've got the Sea Golem and... The Flying Dutchman, which is some kind of like ghostly ship there, air elemental. So you can see that there, both sides have both monsters and ships, but the Cult of the Reef is more monster heavy and the Holy Craftsmen are more ship heavy. I do like that. I think that's, that's, that's a cool idea there. And the whole post-apocalyptic setting in the Age of Sail is also, that's a, that's a setting I don't think anybody has ever touched before. That, that's pretty, that's a pretty neat idea for a setting for a board game and that right there drew me into the game initially right away so I, I, I you know big thumb up on the originality for this game in terms of theme and in terms of gameplay itself you know I mean it's it's not necessarily hugely original I mean this this whole moving around the board and everything you know and firing uh, in your lanes of fire, it's kind of got a Summoner Wars feel a little bit, obviously on a much smaller board. This is just a 3x3, three three. Summoner Wars is a much larger scale in terms of uh, the battlefield. The way the locations work, you know, that uh, kind of like that, they basically give bonuses. You can see this location here is the Holy Craft Yard, and uh, ship, ships cost one less doubloon to play while you've got that. So now let's talk about the aesthetics and everything in the game, the artwork, the graphic design. Now, the, the, most of the artwork, you know, you, you see what this is right here. It's good. I have no issue with this artwork. It's not the most fantastic artwork in the world, but it is still good. The, the big issue I have with most of the artwork is that the game box has this piece of art here, which clearly does not match the style and quality of the majority of the cards. Instead, that matches more with, let me see if I can find them. There were some Kickstarter exclusive cards, I believe they were Kickstarter exclusives, uh, that were in here. Let me see if I can find them. Yeah, like this, the Siren figurehead. That is some high quality artwork right there. Uh, Captain Ahab, this clear, I mean, it's clear that that is in contrast to that not the same level of of quality and if that artwork was just on the kickstarter exclusives well hey you know what that's kind of cool you get some uh fantastic artwork to add to the game and everything but the fact that it's put on the cover of the box i do feel that's a little bit of a problem because it, the, the cover of a box in my opinion should kind of evoke what you're going to be seeing in the game and it's just it just doesn't hold up i mean Again, let me show this to you one more time. The The difference in quality is drastic, in my opinion. So, there's that. And in terms of gameplay, obviously it doesn't affect it in any way, but it is something that people should know and should realize that this is the majority of what you're going to be getting in the game, the, these kind of cards here. Now, I, I've played this game a couple of times, and you know, I've, ha I've had a game last 45 minutes, which I feel is about the right amount of time for this game. I've had a game last two and a half hours, which is, or, or maybe it was like right at two hours. Either way, way too long for this game. And, and what happened in that game was basically myself and my opponent ended up coming to a stalemate, essentially, that... You know, we were just barely, barely doing any damage to each other. And I believe I had like a heal cycle going on with uh, my flagship. Because this down here is the three parts of my flagship. And the idea is that when one of them is destroyed, you lose its special ability. You flip it over. And when all three are destroyed, you lose. Well, you know, I had some kind of heal cycle going on where I was able to continuously heal it. 
And I think that's what was going on. I, I can't remember exactly how that game lasted two and a half hours. The point is that the game should not last that long. And the fact that when we were just using the standard decks that come with the game, we didn't use... Like, this is a huge deck of extra cards that you can build your own decks with and that you can create your own flagships with. We weren't using this. Just the base uh, decks, and it just took so long. There's no reason this game should ever last that long. The The first 45 minutes, I feel like... I, I felt like I was really engaged in the game. I mean, that that's a, a great amount of time for this game. Uh, I felt like it was a lot of fun. You know, we were putting the ships out. We were moving them around everything, firing on each other. Once we got past that 45 minutes, it really started to drag. So... It, and maybe that's maybe that's what I was maybe that was on the way we were playing. We were not playing defensively. It, it was a very aggressive game, and yet we just could not take each other out. Now, real quick, going back to these um, flagships, this is a cool part of the game here that I like. So what you see here is uh, an aft, hull, and bow that comes in the deck for the Holy Craftsman. But really, what you can do is you can see I've got a few right here, some uh, extra pieces here. So, you know, you've got the uh, heraldic banners for the aft. You've got the ten tentacular hull for the, for the hull. Uh, you've got a naval ram for the bow. And I can take any of these and, you know, sub out this. So instead of having the treasure hold as my aft, I could have the heraldic banners. Or, you know, over at uh, the coast of the reef, you could take one of those out and, and swap in the sweeps for the hull. So there are a number of combinations and every single one of these has its own special ability and that sort of thing. So that is a pretty cool idea. And I like that ultimately your ships out here have nothing to do with the wind condition. It's this down here. And that's pretty cool too. I like that. The currency in the game are these doubloons. You, when you spend them, you don't get rid of them. Basically, they go over to spend the doubloons, and at the beginning of the next round, you'll get them back. And you have to decide at the beginning of the round if you're going to add another doubloon to your treasury or if you're going to draw a new card. You don't draw cards unless you choose to. So it's either draw a card or get an extra doubloon. That's a cool decision as well. And now, uh, granted, you get deep enough into the game, you're not going to get any more doubloons. You're only going to draw cards. But early in the game, that becomes a very intriguing decision every round as far as what you're going to do. Now, one last thing that i got to show you here before we go back up top. So, see here, I've got, you know, all these cards are facing, you know, the upwards direction. All right. Now, on a non-ship card, here we've got an effect. You've got the uh, uh, cost up here. You've got your ability down here. I mean, pretty standard, except that this cost really should be over here because, as you can see, here's another effect right here. When you open up your hand, the cost becomes hidden and, and difficult to see. It would be better if they were over here. Uh, not, not the greatest choice in graphic design, but not terrible. But my big issue comes with the ships and monsters. Both ships and monsters are, so you get to name here. Then down here, you've got the cost, which, so when it's like this, again, that's the top right. It really should be over here. But then over here on the left side, you've got your uh, your strength, your health, and your initiative. Well, let's look at this. Okay, here's another, here's a monster. When you open up your hand, now that means the, the cost is over here hidden. And then down here at the bottom in your hand is where this is, is where all of this information is. Now this was on front so you can see it, but I can't see my dragon, I can't see my watcher, I can't see my harpy. And, and so you end up like, you know, having to turn your hand this way and look at cards and open it up like this, if you want to see stuff, or flip it over. And so if I start, if I flip all my ships over, I can look at them and I get, a, it's a little bit better, I can start seeing it kind of, right? Yeah, but then guess what? Your opponent knows which cards in your hand are ships and monsters. So I don't understand that graphic design choice at all. That is pretty terrible. Um, I mean, really, an awful decision as far as graphic design goes. I don't, I don't get that at all. Oh, and one final thing before we go back up top. Initiative. Every 
single ship almost has two initiative. I want to say in all the decks, including the extra cards. So in both base decks and the extra cards combined, there's maybe, maybe four ships that have a initiative different than two. Um, and, and it doesn't differ by much. And the initiative determines if you get into a battle with another ship or if you fire on a ship. So let's say, let's, let's say that, that this guy fires, give him out of the way so he's not blocking him. Let's say the zealot fires on the Har from beyond. And the, you know, the Har from beyond would deal the one damage and, oh, actually, I guess the Zealot, that's a bad choice, bad example, because the Zealot can't. Let's do the Legion. Legion do deals six damage, right? Har from Beyond deals one damage. That's what the strength is all about. And they both have a two initiative. So they deal that damage to each other at the same time. If the Crusader instead fire on uh, this way, and, and really, by the way, when you're firing, you're firing on the, uh, the flagship. You don't fire on an enemy um, ship unless you have an ability unless you do it, but they could choose to block. And that's really what we're talking about here. If the Crusader were to fire on the flagship, he has an initiative of three. The Horror from Beyond has an initiative of two, so the damage is not going to be done at the same time. You're going to resolve it in initiative order. Which is a really cool idea if more ships use it, but that's really, this three is the exception to the rule. Most, the vast, vast majority of ships only have initiative two. And uh, I don't understand if that was just, it, it feels like they had this cool idea and then they wanted to, they're having difficulty balancing it maybe. And so everything just ended up defaulting down to two. And that's really unfortunate. Also with location cards, very few of them in the game as well. I feel like there were some missed opportunities there. There should have been more location cards. Uh, and again, even in the extra, this huge pile of extra cards, very few locations to add, very few ships that don't have initiative to. So one other thing that I need to mention because it's, it's pretty important actually is the rule book has a pretty glaring um, omission. There's uh, the, I showed you the Inspire and Demoralize tokens, which play a pretty large role in the game. There's a lot of, of, of ships and a lot of effects and abilities and stuff that use either Inspire or Demoralize. That rule's not in the rule book. It's not in there. Somehow it missed the final cut of the rule book and the game got printed without that rule in there. So that's pretty unfortunate and it is something that you need to know. Now, the rules of how to use them and everything are, are on uh, Board Game Geek. They've, they've been, that's been addressed by the designer uh, pretty quickly, but it is something that should be noted. So with this game... It, it, I'm a little bit torn on this game. On the one hand, it's such a cool idea. And the first time, uh, you know, I played it, it, it felt like there's a lot of promise there. I, I think it's a game that if I was asked to play it, then I probably would. But then I'm going to need a break for two weeks or so before I play it again. Because really, there's just not a whole lot there with... There, there's a lot of missed opportunities there is what it comes down to. Not enough variation in the abilities of the ships from faction, like to make the factions feel completely different. A aesthetically, they're different. The, uh, you know, with one being monster heavy, one being ship heavy. But then there's a lot of monsters and ships that are pretty much parallels to each other that do pretty much the same thing. And on top of that, the fact that all of the initiative... You know, that, that whole idea of an initiative order in the battles is kind of nullified by the fact that most everything is initiative two. And, and then the battlefield itself is three by three, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you can't go over to your opponent's battlefield. You have to stay on your, on your board. So it really is just three by three as far as your maneuvering goes. And then not nearly enough locations. Locations could have been such an amazing boost for this game if there were more of them. And the ones that are there just are not compelling enough for my taste. It's, it's really unfortunate. Really what this feels like is that there just simply was not enough development with this game. And I think that, you know, one of the clearest examples is that graphic design issue with the cards. You know, I... That's something that I feel like with a little more development, 
that would have been caught. It would have been dealt with. So on BGG, I gave this game a 5.9, and this kind of, that, that feels just about right for me. It's uh, got some cool ideas. It, it's got some really cool uh, aspects. I really do like a lot the flagship aspect of this game, where you kind of can mix and match your flagship, and the flagship is the thing that you're protecting and that is you that, that that's your your life right there and it's giving you powers and stuff and then as parts of it get destroyed you're losing those powers but just not quite enough to really make this a game that i want to bring to the table with any frequency whatsoever so that's winds of fortune got a 5.9 for me on bgg hope you enjoy this video and uh, until next time if you're bored online bored offline Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.